Hello, I'm James Yardley, and today I'm joined by Ben Moore, the fund manager of the Threadneedle European Select Fund. Thanks for joining us, Ben. Thanks for having me, James. Now, Ben, you've been the lead manager on this fund since the start of the year. How's it been going, and have you made any changes to the process? Uh, the short answer would actually be no, that we, we haven't made meaningful changes this year. If anything, uh, we made more changes last year because the market environment was so exceptional. Um, even though I'm officially lead manager since the 1st of January this year, I've actually been on the fund for two and a half years. So it's a very particular strategy, and I've had enough time to, to make sure that the, the approach that we have and the types of business that we focus on investing in is very coherent with the way I invest. Um, so, no, there haven't been meaningful changes this year. And then why should uh, investors consider investing in Europe today? We've got all the fast tech companies uh, in the US and we've got faster growth in Asia. So, so why should investors consider Europe? Yeah, I think that's a fair, a fair question. As you, as you probably know, James, the, the strategy is actually very particular about the type of companies that we'll invest in. We have a very clear long-term approach we really look for exceptional businesses. And there are some exceptional businesses in Europe that, that it's, it's wonderful to have the opportunity to look at and invest in at the right price. Um, the, I think you made a completely valid point about tech and about growth um, in, in the US or in Asia. But what we do have in, in Europe are some very dominant competitive positions and some management teams, often founders or owners, that manage the company with a very, very long-term perspective, uh, which is very compatible with how we look at the world. Um, so there are, some, there are some wonderful niches that are actually dominated um, from, from Europe. So tell us a little bit about some of, some of the businesses which you hold in the fund. Um, what about Inditex, for example? What, what do they do? Sure. So Inditex um, is the parent company of Zara. Um, it's a, it's a, a fashion retailer. Um, it's a business that we built our position significantly last year during the pandemic, when there was a lot of concern that uh, high street retail was suffering meaningfully and that Inditex would suffer with it. And in fact, uh, Inditex clearly did suffer a lot as the high streets were closed, but it was a huge opportunity for them from a market share perspective. And they are actually emerging from the pandemic as a much stronger business. There are two or three factors there. One is that the online business of Inditex is as profitable as their um, physical retail business because of the size of their, their basket, which is about 80 euros. And that means that as their online business has grown, it's now over, over a quarter of the business. Um, that has actually been net neutral or even possibly beneficial to profitability and returns. Um, then because the company operates such a flexible business model and has such a good control of their cost base, uh, they were able to respond particularly quickly to the events of last year and adapt to different trends of demand. And it meant that they've emerged as a much more nimble business. Well, many of their competitors have actually gone bankrupt. And so they're coming out of the pandemic. They just reported actually last week, um, revenues were tracking 9% higher for the, than the same period in 2019, despite the fact that 10% of their stores are closed. So you can see that there's a clear market share shift in their favor. Um, so that's Inditex. And we've all heard a lot about semiconductors recently and, and the shortages there have been. Um, I see you hold ASML as one of your top holdings. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about them? Sure. Um, so, you, you asked the valid question about tech in, in the US and in Asia being more attractive than Europe. And I think 
you could definitely make that case overall, but there are some exceptional tech businesses in Europe, and I think ASML is one of them. Um, ASML has a very dominant position as a supplier of equipment to the semiconductor manufacturing industry. So um, if you make a chip, uh, if, if you, the first stage of semiconductor manufacturing involves projecting an image of what the chip is going to be, how the chip is going to be designed onto the silicon substrate. And ASML effectively makes a, a, a much more sophisticated version of a photocopier that beams the imprint of that chip onto the silicon. And we're talking about photocopiers, but in fact, because of the sophistication and the shrinkage that we've seen in the industry, uh, you need to be able to beam or, or print onto extremely small pieces of silicon or in, in extremely minute levels of detail. And there's in fact only one company that is able to do that at the scale and at the level of detail that ASML is able to print, um, which is ASML. So they have a very dominant position and they facilitate basically chips getting smaller, um, which they do every year. Yes, it's almost like magic, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and, and they don't really have any any major competitors then, or uh, they 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 don't. I think of it slightly as a cooperative. Actually, effectively, the ASML's research budget is two to two and a half billion dollars at the moment. And uh, if they had a competitor, then you would have two people spending a meaningful amount of money to get to a very similar end. And so it seems that their customers, who are also very concentrated, have taken the view that they'd rather focus that R&D with one player um, to be able to get the maximum benefit and the maximum level of shrinkage that they can and efficiency from a single player rather than spreading that across many suppliers. So it's, it's a very dominant competitive position. And finally, you hold Worldline, an online payments processor. Um, how, how has that been doing over the past 18 months or so with, uh, with the impact of the pandemic? Yes, uh, I'd say Worldline has definitely suffered. Um, I, I, would, I would make it sort of slightly analogous to Inditex to the extent that Worldline processes card payments, um, physical card payments and online card payments. And particularly for their physical card payments, the volumes have come under pressure, and that's been a negative for Worldline. The positive has been that there has been more and more consolidation in the industry, which means there are fewer and fewer players like Worldline that operate with an equivalent business model. And that means that they, they come out of the pandemic with a higher level of market share, which should be beneficial in the long run as things get back to normal. Ben, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks, James. And if you'd like to learn more about the Threadneedle European Select Fund, please visit fundcaliber.com.